All right, I am now ready to do the refined painting layer. So I've built a new layer on top of my base painting, which is almost everything on a gray background. And this refined painting I'm doing at a lower opacity, around 40%. And my brush is smaller. It was around 140 pixels, now it's about 70 pixels. And I'm stealing color, and I'm layering it on top of itself, and then stealing from where it overlaps. And you can smooth and paint more and more. Any whites I paint are going to get blended with the colors around. I'm using each choice, like in this instance, to frame in the white of his eye and then to show the darkness of his pupil. Because it's a low opacity, I have to hit it several times to get anything opaque, but it also gives me the opportunity to bring in other colors to layer in. And this is why on magazine covers and anything that's retouched in Photoshop, they always idealize, it's because you have to kind of make all of these decisions. And so I'm not going to give him like blonde hair and blue eyes, I'm going to match my reference. But I get to give him more color if I want and make it kind of more experimental. This is here to, to get me to be a little less comfortable with just the status quo. Go a little bit bolder with my colors. Now, this refined layer, it builds up slowly. And on its own, it doesn't look like much. But when you combine that with the base layer, it gets fuller and fuller. So just look at the difference between those two eyes now. And that's just with a few hits of, of a refined painting layer. And as you build up more kind of color inside, more variations, it's easier to steal color from yourself. Like I want to put some of this green into his hair. Even this old painting has some of those kind of blues and greens and oranges in the hair. And I can still see my blue sketch coming through. And I, that's another reason I like doing a base kind of sketch, an analytic sketch in blue, is it's almost like the veins underneath. And I'm painting the, the layers of flesh on top. At different opacities and translucencies. Blending them together. Very vigorously. Now, Sometimes I'll feel like my brush doesn't have enough texture in it. And my brush isn't bad. If you look at it, there's quite a bit of, of nice kind of rounded texture at the edge. But if I want to go back to my brush settings, you also have an option for adding noise to the brush, which just gives it a little bit more sharpness at the edge and kind of holes poked through. So that might be a good addition for your refined painting layer. You don't tend to want a whole lot of texture in your base painting. And then the other option you have is to actually add a texture. And you can set the, the depth jitter of your texture and the depth so that it's, it's quite textured, right? And sometimes that can be helpful. So I'll, I'll turn those both on, see how I like them. happened here. <laughs> Somehow I lost a lot. Oh, well, there we go. Huh. I think I went back in time or something. There we go. I deleted layers. I did not mean to. Okay. So with my brush settings, I now have texture and noise turned on. And sometimes that can be really helpful so that things don't get too smoothed out as you're doing a refined painting. And remember, because you're at a lower opacity, you have to hit it pretty hard when you want the color to change dramatically. So it's going to leave a lot of that color artifact there, which is nice. 
Now you'll notice in my lower left hand corner, I am zoomed in at 100%. There is no reason for me to ever zoom in more than 100% because I am seeing the pixels at full resolution here. And it's pretty small. This is maybe like 1 50th of the overall painting. So if you zoom in, zoom in more than 100%, you are just wasting your time. Because it won't show up in the print. And this gives me the, the resolution I need to kind of frame up his nostril, get the highlight over the nostril, and get the shadows in the right place. Now, of course, comfort with drawing and with painting makes all of this easier. All of these skills are transferable. And so I'm not grading you or scoring you on how well you draw or paint. I'm hoping to, to get you to come up with your own approach to digital painting. I'm trying to show what I think is useful. And then the more you do it, the more confident you'll become, the stronger the work will be. And you can see in this way, especially with the noise and the texture turned on the brush, that base color really means something. It will always kind of come through. So I think that's a good thing. You know, it means you're not having to repaint. All right. So we've seen the difference it can make. That's the difference it can make from a distance. So now it just takes a lot more than just the fun part of the eye, you know, to keep, to keep going. I don't want that much reflection. Let's see. And painting really, especially portrait painting, it kind of, its lifeblood is soft edges. So try not to go in there with a really sharp brush and just like draw the eyelashes. <laughs> It's really about the softness of the space. Now you can have any kind of approach and style you like, but softness is something that will help your painting. You kind of build the textures more slowly that way. Build the illusion more believably. And the whites of the eyes, notice how narrow they really are. Some of that green under his eyes.
Now, if you want to try a different brush or try higher opacity, try different brush settings, feel free. This is how you're, you're getting, setting your approach up. And I might have a fault in my digital paintings where I don't want it to look digital. And I'm kind of always actively fighting against it looking too digital, which is why I'll usually reference inspiration examples that are, are traditional practices, even if they're not always painting, like this fused glass. But the thing that makes something look digital to me is that the texture is too even. Like when you zoom up and it's only pinks. Instead of having a little bit of every color everywhere. And do pay attention to the shadow shapes, where the highlights are. And that you can get away with cool colors in your shadows, like the little purple and the brown. A little blue, a little green. And with each stroke of your stylus, even if you're not really sure what you're doing with it, you're at least building up texture, you know, even if you're just kind of searching for a pathway. Sometimes you have to reestablish highlights and then knock them back. You bring in a color to realize it's the wrong color and then start painting out from it because we're refined. Happens slowly because we're at a low opacity. Notice I'm not having to steal colors much at all anymore because I have all the colors here already for me. But every once in a while, I might want to introduce something just brand new. I spend a lot of time squinting. It's helpful to see it on the navigator because when we get into blending, sometimes we just push everything too close to the middle and we lose the overall lights and darks that give it its uh, strong contrast to begin with. Frame in the face a little bit with some contrast here. behind his ear, neck. And even if you want something to look colorful, which ultimately I do with this, it doesn't mean you don't use gray and brown and things that aren't that colorful, because you need that contrast. And then if you go too dark, remember you can knock things back. So instead of using the eraser, I, I just always think the, uh, the answer is more paint. <laughs> Layering it up. Refining your shapes as you go. I think it's always a safe bet to use red around the eyes because there's a lot of blood flow that you're seeing through the layer of the eyelids near the tear ducts. Really for any skin tone, you can do kind of those deep siennas and reds 